Oh my Welcome. goodness. Well, thank you so Friends much. Uh, uh, thank I'm going to I take my mask off because I, my assistant is here. So we're trying to protect each other. In this no, you know, I'm here. Yeah. <laughs> what else do we have? <laughs> right. <laughs> I know I was just thumbing through some of the news and oh my God. Just, oh yeah. my God. Oh, yes. Mm. Oh. Just amazing. Yeah, this should be a very interesting conversation. I'm, I'm looking forward to it. Well, we wanted to reach out to you and uh, just have you join us, even though you didn't feel completely comfortable giving us an endorsement. There's so many ways in which your work resonates with our work and our book. And uh, so I've got a few questions and I'm sure Andrew does. And, and let's just dive in. Okay, sounds good. And, and you're up in... Uh, Poor Townsend? Poor Townsend, yeah, okay. exactly, yeah. Okay. So, Doug, when I read your really extraordinary book, The End of Ice, which I bless Carolyn for, and I've given to everybody I know, so there are a lot of people in Oak Park yeah. reading you at this moment, I was moved by two things. I was moved by your relentless confrontation with the absolutely devastating facts that you were uncovering about what's really happening in the climate. And I was moved by the unbelievable courage that you showed in your willingness to face the disastrous truth. And I was also extremely moved by the quality of your response by what was born in you through that confrontation because instead of driving you to despair which you confronted again and again but went through it engendered in you a wholly new level of awe and wonder and compassion and that to me is at the heart of the book that Carolyn and I have written, whether you agree with the mystical part of it or not, what's at the heart of it is that this appalling crisis can be a huge gift to our humanity by awakening us to the necessity of putting love into practice at the deepest imaginable level, come what may. Mm -hmm. And I would love it if you could begin by just describing for our audience your amazing journey and what it has brought you to, because this to me is really at the core of what you're speaking about in the end device and the core of what you're representing. Well, first of all, thank you both for having me. And, and Andrew, I'm really humbled by your words about the book. I put everything I had into that book and that shows. It, it was really my last, it was my swan song of journalism. And, and I, I stopped working as a journalist shortly after it was published. And um, I, I, uh, the process was first, it, it was, it, it came from, well, if people really understand what's happening, um, maybe they'll think and behave differently. Uh, and, and then uh, amidst the work that got set aside, uh, watching it, you know, the appalling disinformation and misinformation and willful ignorance uh, spread across the United States at this point in history. And it really became more of an ode to the planet and that I was getting to go see these places and try to represent them as accurately as I could while going through my own grieving process and my own dismay of seeing what was happening because consistently what I found was it was one thing to do the research about uh, what was happening say to the Great Barrier Reef and then it was in no bleaching events were happening accelerating becoming worse we we're in the process of losing virtually all the coral on the planet um, and, and it was quite another to go see it in person oh, yeah. and just have, just be floored, just be devastated and, and, and have my heart broken. And, and that happened virtually everywhere that I went for the book, uh, from glaciers in Alaska to the Amazon rainforest to the great, great barrier reef. 
And then shockingly, since when I wrote the book, things in all those areas are far worse now than they were in the book. And they were devastating already in the book, um, which I think just shows how the, 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 the acceleration of what's happening. But really, especially the way that you asked that question, what really uh, it affirms in me is that I use the analogy of uh, which I brought into the um, epilogue of the paperback of the book um, of getting of having the uh, great privilege of getting to sit with my best friend as he left this world. And that's, that's what came to me again, listening to you ask that question where when we know, when we look honestly and clearly at what's happening with the climate crisis, with the political crisis, with COVID-19, with everything, and look at it really clearly, how is this not akin to uh, a death? Um, so many different kinds of deaths. And going through that process, those of us who've had the privilege of sitting with someone close to us, helping them die, what comes up is nothing but love, is all the other bullshit is just swept away with a, a wind yes. and all that's left is I am I am here with this person and there's nothing but connection and that's all that matters and then in the aftermath of that death that is literally all that's left because you know I can remember sitting in that room and then walking out of the hospital and walking out uh, uh, to a parking lot to my car to go stay with some friends um one of them a, a retired hospice nurse and and talk with them and share it and just being enveloped in that that just pure love of you know all that's matter is what's in my heart for my best friend and then now with these friends that i'm sitting with talking about it and that's this special special time that uh you know i think our work now is how do we cultivate that uh even you know, not having gone through a very profound experience with literally sitting with someone helping them die, uh, while um, that is essentially what's happening. And I think that both of your work speaks very articulately to that. You know, and how how do we do that on on a daily basis now when that literally is, we are in this era of loss? Well, how do you do that? That's yeah. what I want to know. Yeah. I've been. Da I, I feel you doing that in the book. I think that's why the book is such a great contribution because you come out of this multiple heartbreak that you went through, not angry, not denouncing, not in any way demonizing, but in a state of renewed wonder and deeper and deeper love. That to me is the amazing contribution of your book and an amazing sign of what we're calling radical regeneration. Because if we can, through this horror and through this tragedy, find our hearts being opened at a level that we never imagined they could be opened, that is already a profoundly sacred experience. And how do we sustain that opening of the heart through what is going to be a horrific period? How do you do it? Help us by telling us about how you do it. What gives you your sacred inspiration? And if you don't like the word sacred, throw it out. It doesn't matter about what words we use. What matters is the state. No, I, I do appreciate that word. And I think that is what what it is and and that is the great silver lining of this time where it, it is an apocalypse i mean yes. everything is collapsing and the horror show that's upon us that is upon us uh there's no more future tense about that other than the future it's going to get even harder and worse and 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 darker um and it is this opportunity to really get down to what's very, very important. And, and part of me, like, asking that question, I, I mean, I feel like I'm making this up as I go along. Yes. In that, you know, I, I had that experience with the book. And, and I feel like now I get to practice having that every day. Like I was just talking to a friend right before 
we got on this call uh, just overwhelmed by the news, you know, and, and I, I uh, every day get to go through those cycles of the anger, you know, the denouncing, the frustration, the, the shock, the surprise, and then come down to what's really important, which, you know, when, when I sit down with um, uh, the person, I have one person in a pod uh, now in COVID that we actually have the exact same um, safety measures, which are very, very careful. And uh, uh, so we share meals together. And one of the things that we do, and we did this when we could have other people here before the virus as well, is we sit down for dinner and the way that we pray is we say, we have to name at least one thing that we're grateful for. And you're allowed to include more than one thing. And then at least one thing that you did for the earth today. And, and it can be more than one thing. And, and the gratitude, especially now, is down to, I am grateful that I'm healthy. I'm grateful that I have food to eat. I am grateful that I still live in, I live in what's still generally a functioning ecosystem. And, and framing things just with that honesty of, we are in this, everything's collapsing, but we're still here. These trees out my window are still here. This, I can, I have fresh air to breathe. It's down to that level akin to when I'm sitting with my, best friend when he's on his way out of the planet that I have one more second with him one more second one more second it's it's like that yeah yeah you know I have a question for you Dar um first of all I, I just want to mention that you and Barbara Cecil did a wonderful series on truthout.org called how shall we then live and I, I invite everybody to go to that series how shall we then live the truth out um, but one of the things you said in there in there and I think also in your book the truth can be calming as it sets our feet on solid ground dispelling the obfuscation mist of lies deceptions and fossil fueled propaganda that colors the dominant culture can you say more about that? Yeah, thank you. And thank you for your words, Carolyn, about that column. We often talk about striking it back up, but I've been, I think part of my process in this time is I've really pulled deep within myself and out of doing very much publicly at all. And um, um, because it feels like a sacred time. I mean, it feels, it's like, you know, it's like when I was sitting with my friend, I'm going to keep using this, this death analogy. Like I didn't have any bandwidth for anything else. Yes. And, and that's what this feels like. You know, it's really an important time to really, you know, stay very centered and stay with what is the one thing that we're doing right now. Right. But I, I think in response to your question, uh, getting, getting, being honest about the hard, hard truths and, and as devastating as they are, is actually easier than uh, being engaged in some kind of form of hope and denialism that, oh, you know, Biden's going to change things for us now. Or because whenever we, whenever we distract ourselves down these, these, these false paths, I think it's, uh, it actually causes more internal distress. It's like, you know, when someone's lying to you, you know, and it, and it brings up a lot of feelings. It brings up fear because, okay, there's something else going on here that I can't really put my finger on. And, and I think that not knowing that comes with the denialism and the pretending that things aren't as they actually are, it opens, at least inside of me, this kind of, you know, that Hitchcockian unsaid, unspoken space that then we fill with the dark parts of our imagination. And, and that starts reverber reverberating within us um, and within our psyches and within our souls. And I think that's really harmful. Um, in fact, today, I would say it's, it's actually, given the sacredness of this moment and how important it is to be so present with um, the people that we care for and the places that we're trying to steward, that that kind of lies and deceit is akin to a, a form of spiritual violence. And, and so really being, 
extremely honest about, look, we're, look at the Arctic. We have to accept, look, the methane's already coming out. This is, this is from the shallow seed beds. Um, this is upon us now. This is happening. And look at, look squarely. This is an authoritarian state. Look at what's being done. We are in free for all collapse. Let's be very honest about this. Now then we can stand on, okay, our feet are on the ground. Now we can behave accordingly. And, and we have all the options available to, okay, what this time is upon us. What, what am I going to do and how am I going to be? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you said in, uh, in End of Ice, uh, I think in the introduction, you said that reporting on the climate catastrophe was almost more difficult for you than reporting on the war in Iraq when you were a journalist in Iraq. Um, to say more about that, please. Um, yeah, and, that, and that's not to uh, discount in any way the devastation um, oh. that I witnessed in Iraq and you know, will live with for the rest of my life with that, the PTSD that came from that. And you know, the fact is just from the occupation alone, we're talking about over a million Iraqis that were annihilated as a direct result of US policy there. And, uh, and, the, and that it is ongoing. Um, but that's one country and the book addresses, we're talking about the entire planet. We're talking about, and not just our species, but every species on the planet that had nothing to do with causing this catastrophe. And, and there's all these levels of, of acceptance that I've had to push through, which, you know, my, in my own, my own culpability in that, my own, you know, fly using jets to fly around working on the book, the fact that, you know, while I've gone to great lengths to minimize fossil fuel use in my own world, like no matter what, if we live in modern times, like we're, we're using, you know, we're all culpable to some degree and what, how do I weigh that against, you know, the work that I'm trying to do. So there's all these myriad levels of that, but I think, you know, the book, uh, that fear of, you know, what, when I had the moment from back in 2013, when I realized through a lot of research and reading about how far along we already were then regarding the climate crisis. And uh, um, I had that moment of getting, okay, we're, we're absolutely off the cliff. There's no way that this is gonna, you know, we, we're gonna go through this tunnel now. Um, there's no getting out of it. And then my fight or flight kicked in literally. And part of me is like, I wanna go. It's like, well, can't leave the planet. Uh, and then, and then just having to deal with, um, uh, you know, and then the fight, like, oh, I want to try to change this or stop it somehow. And then, and then going through that and then coming in, starting to come into acceptance. And so on, on having that on a planetary scale, I think with the book, it was really, really, uh, um, you know, a whole nother level because in Iraq as challenging as that was reporting there. Um, I could always leave. And yeah, that was a tremendous position of privilege. Uh, uh, <coughs> excuse me. But um, I, I could essentially leave the country. And, uh, you know, we, we can't leave the planet. And so we have to contend with all of this. I would love to ask you, given the depth at which you've meditated on this catastrophe, what, in your opinion, is at the root of our continuing denial that such a catastrophe is taking place? What is at the root of this absolute madness of denial? Why are we so profoundly crazy? That's a very important question. And I, I, one of the pieces of news that I saw today that deeply was deeply disturbing was seeing a nurse uh, from a hospital talking about people treating people with COVID who still don't believe in the, the pandemic. Um, right. They're literally screaming at them up until the point at which they're intubated, at which point you can't speak. And that people are dying from a disease that they do not believe exists. Is that not the perfect analogy to uh, the climate crisis? Uh, so 
I, this is why I got into journalism back uh, during the lead up to the Iraq war. I had a crash course in um, getting to literally, you know, my, my, my journalism career, I'm going to go on for a little bit here, but it's, sure, it's, it's my answer is I dove into journalism with no experience in 2003, <laughs> a year and a half later, I'm sitting having dinner literally personally with Noam Chomsky and Howard Zinn because of my work, because I was one of the only people over there telling the truth. Um, I wasn't doing something extraordinary. I was just telling the truth against the backdrop of a corporate media that was doing the opposite. So that earned me a, a dinner uh, through a friend of a friend uh, with these two extraordinary gentlemen. And I basically got schooled on how did we get here in this country, you know, back to your question. And, you know, some of the things, you know, I'll share with some of what Howard Zinn shared and then um, some of it's my own analysis, and then some of it's from Chomsky's work is, you know, with the consolidation of the media that really started back in the 1930s, uh, the, 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 the very beginnings, the origins of the corporatization of the press, uh, that's one trend going through time. And now here we are where it's almost this monolithic structure of, of most of them saying the same thing. Uh, and then coupled with uh, cutting education, you know, somewhere around the 60s and 70s, and especially with the Reagan era in the 80s, let's start deregulating everything, cutting education, uh, cutting controls on corporate advertisers, being able to use military psychological operations tactics to sell people products that then externalizes, okay, you're, it tells us, you know, you stink, you're fat, you don't have six pack abs, your breast stinks, buy this car, toothbrush, deodorant, <laughs> whatever, and then you're gonna be okay. So the message is, you're shit, you need to buy this thing external and consume it to be okay. So do that for decades to a population, coupled with cutting education, cutting critical thinking courses, and then now, you know, mix in gross uh, entertainment, uh, distraction, hyper technology, over informationalization, over informationalization, all of that together. Now we have a, a population, huge segments of which, as I just described an example of, more closely resemble the population in George Orwell's 1984 than anything else. And so, you know, how is it that 71 million people in this country voted for a, a man who literally won't do anything about a global pandemic that's now killed nearly a quarter million Americans uh, and is raging like wildfire as we speak. How is that possible? And, and I think it's the combination of all those different factors over time where, you know, we literally have an infantilized population, uh, not completely, but a huge segment of is completely infantilized. And I think at this point, largely incapable of independent thought. And that means will not, cannot take responsibility for being an autonomous, independent human being and thinking for themselves and then behaving accordingly to all these crises that are upon us. And that, that's why I got into journalism and it's why I got out of journalism. I would love it if you'd write a book on what you just said. <laughs> just tracing that whole devolution of reality. It is, and it's, it's why we have the horror show that we have today and why we have the Republican Party that is, you know, akin at this point to, you know, what was happening in Germany in the late 1930s, you so, know, where, you know, how is it that you have people supporting representatives that are trying to take away this, pathetic, awful health care that we already have, but even trying to take that away and then still voting and supporting these people and running around in groups without masks, it's, it is utter madness at this point. And, and that's a thing that, you know, no wonder people are in denial because it's, it's terrifying. Yeah. And it's terrifying to think now you can go out just to go to the grocery store is, uh, is risky, you know, because there could be you know, one of one person there 
that flips out and and you could get infected and so it's uh it's a mad mad time and and we have to behave accordingly um anyway i've gone on and on I've no gone. i you've put it Thank wonderfully you so much for going on and on <laughs> i would like to float something to you and see if this resonates with you because I think everything that you've said is perfectly true and it's a wonderful explanation. But what I've noticed in the last 30 years is a real hatred of life, a real hatred of the kind of life that industrial civilization has given us, an atomized, pointless, meaningless, spiritless, soulless life in which we're told that it's only if we're thin and rich that we could have any meaning at all. And this message that comes from a profound separation from the sacred, this message is essentially a nihilistic message and has contaminated the heart and the soul of humanity in such a way that when presented with the real agony of the real situation, it has no spiritual force to rise up to meet it. That's what I feel. So it goes even deeper than all of these marvelous things that you've said it goes to the core of a disease a spiritual disease paul levy has called this spiritual disease wetiko and it's a profound loathing of everything that is true everything that is humbly rich about this experience and its inevitable result is denial and continuing in the addictive behaviors that ensure matricide and suicide on the path of the human race and then i step back and i thinking of you and your journey and your amazing book and the man that I see in front of me and all that you're saying. I think that one of the strange miraculous graces of this time is that those who are brave enough to face the facts and wake up to the horror of the facts are given a chance to restore the soul's meaning, to restore the richness of the heart, to live in a world if Indeed, it is for the last time, for the last time, but with the kind of love and care and communion that we should always have lived. So in the destruction is this priceless jewel that if we can grasp it, reconnects us to all of the values that we have so ruthlessly shredded and so maimed ourselves through that shredding. Does that make any sense to you? Perfectly. Yeah, it, extremely, you know, perfectly articulated. And, and uh, I, I completely agree. Um, it covered a lot of ground. Um, I, a lot of things there I'd like to try to remember to address. Um, I think the, 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 the bankruptcy of spirituality in this country yes. is, is, I mean, that's what you just pointed at. And yes. How, how could that not happen, given this is a country founded on genocide and slavery, uh, a genocide to this day that it pretends didn't happen? And so if that's the foundation, this bloody denialist foundation, you know, foundation of, of death and slavery and denial, uh, what, whatever you build on that, how is it not going to be rotten, stinking, corrupted, vile, and ultimately collapse upon itself? And, uh, you know, I... Uh, it's triple genocides, really, isn't it? It's a genocide of the Indians, it's a genocide of slavery, and it's a genocide of nature. That's right. That's right. Triple genocide supporting this golden palace of insane distraction. Exactly. Right. And so... Um, you know, and it was Martin Luther King who said, I believe it was his Vietnam, be, Beyond Vietnam speech. I, I think that was in 1968. Um, I could be wrong, but um, right around that time said, you know, any country that, I'm paraphrasing, puts more of its money into militarism than it does in self social welfare programs is approaching spiritual death. 
Well, that's more than 50 years ago. Right. That the genius of Martin Luther King shed light on that. That's more than half a century ago. Well, actually, the real witnesses to the spiritual death came in the 19th century. They were Emerson and Whitman in his late years. And, of course, Mo Herman Melville, because now we're living in Moby Dick. Trump right. is Ahab. Yeah. Right? Searching for the white whale of white supremacy, and <laughs> the whole ship is going down through it. So, at the very beginning of this explosion of American power, there were these tragic, illumined witnesses to what would happen if America chose money and power over harmony and justice. And then this comes back down to the foundation, this, which is exactly what the indigenous people of this country were saying upon first contact with the white settlers, looking at this consumption, how they were treating the earth, how they were treating their own women. Uh, look, at, look at what these people are doing, they are insane. And, you know, it was-, it was uh, Chief Jack Seattle's speech in 1854, that's the defining right. speech of American history. It, it really is, it really is. And, and, and that is what is upon us now. And, None of this is news to those, those populations. And so, you know, with uh, my exposure to the Waitiko disease was from Jack Forbes' book, Columbus and Other Cannibals. And he likens you know, Waitiko as an indigenous word for cannibalism, um, calling, you know, basically for those who haven't, aren't familiar with this, is uh, it's a pathological illness. And if you have it, you believe that it's okay to take a, another person's life and resources right. for your own benefit. And so these settlers that showed up in 1492 uh, were infected with Waitiko, and it is catching. Uh, and, and that is now what we are in, you know, that is capitalism. And that is precisely the capitalism that we're in now. And so, um, again, seeing all of that and getting really, really clear of, that what's happening, I just actually uh, talk, spoke with someone yesterday who shared, I think, a brilliant way of putting what's upon us it's it's break down to break through that's it and, and this is what's happening it has to break down if we if there's any hope of breaking through and evolving and going forward in any kind of a good way you know this whole thing has to come down the time for in, incremental change i don't right. even know if it ever had a chance uh even to say it was well that past 20 years ago i think given that this has always been a way Tico system, um, that we've never really had that possibility. And now, you know, that reframes everything. If you look at the news, well, do I want to watch this, the, the fast motion train wreck again to see the gory details and the bodies flying out the windows another day? Because this is a complete utter breakdown of the system and it, it, it is collapsing and there's no way it's going to go back to what it was a few years ago or even a couple of years ago. And it would be a disaster if it did, because that normal was psychotic. Our one small chance of sanity is to go through this horrific breakdown and to let it break down and to discover the values that you discover in your amazing book, the values of witnessing, compassion, or at the beauty of nature, or at the intensity of love that disaster can release. These are not small revelations. It, exactly. And it, and it comes down to, um, by uh, one of the quotes at, at the very end of that book, I quote Stan Rushworth, uh, uh, an indigenous scholar and who's become a very dear friend. And uh, he talks about, well, how, how are we going to comport ourselves during this time? you know, and, and uh, basically how do you behave during an emergency, a chronic emergency situation? How are we going to comport ourselves during this time? Like, um, am I, and again, back to the analogy of helping someone that you love dearly die, um, do you stop loving them and treating <laughs> exactly. them with dignity and respect because they're sick and you know for sure that they're going to die? No, in fact, you do the opposite. Exactly. So you show even more love. Anything that was left unsaid, that's when you're going to say it. You you behave with 
as much integrity and honesty and clarity as you possibly can. And that takes a tremendous amount of focus and energy. And then after they're gone, ideally you would keep behaving that way. And I think, I think that is what is upon us. And so literally it's, it's, it's imperative now to treat all people, even those are, are hard, possibly even to say, especially those that are deeply spiritually sick and completely utterly checked out, treat them with uh, integrity and respect and politeness. Uh, because what else are we going to do during these times? Because to do the opposite is just to continue that descent into this madness. And there is a force of what we would call radical regeneration just in what you're saying. That's mm. where it comes from. Because if you can celebrate what's leaving with utter focus and utter dedication of heart, it will transform you. It will focus you. It will crystallize the very best in you so that you turn up with humble dignity and tender strength and illumined compassion in whatever situation confronts you, whatever happens. Precise. And that's very close to the traditional descriptions of enlightenment. Hmm. One, of the, one of the things that we have uh, emphasized in our book is the evolutionary impulse. And of course, you know, we all know of people who right now are writing books and making videos about extinction and, you know, they, they seem to have this one litany consisting of two words, we're fucked. And, you know, and there's nothing beyond that. And, um, and it's very easy, I think, to become um, obsessed and depressed with, with that belief. Um, we take the position, uh, I think, that of, you know, we're really questioning, um, is that, is that all there is? Is, is oh. that the total truth? And, you know, from my perspective, it seems to me that at the end of all of this destruction, there may be a remnant of humans left, you know? And I, I have to wonder if there is a remnant of humans left, however small it might be, and considering what they have gone through in this devastation, um, what might they create? How might they evolve from there? And I keep coming back to, do I want to serve, we're fucked, we're fucked, we're fucked, yeah. or do I want to serve this possibility that the evolutionary impulse will go on somehow um, among many, many species? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, thanks. That's what we threw out in the book, and um, like to know your take on that. Yeah, and and I I have a lot of empathy for the the we're fucked uh, mindset oh, because I I was I was there for a while. I was yeah. I was one of those people. Sure, um, was too for, for for a long time, and but it was in the process of working on the book and being completely cracked open by what I was seeing happening to the planet where uh, it, it changed me. That process changed me. Yeah. And I basically got to a point, it's like, and I even still have in the book, I left in even when I had a chance to make any more edits doing the adding in the epilogue when it came out in paperback was, it, it still is hard for me to see that that is not how this ends up. Yeah. But you know, like what Andrew said a few minutes ago, that doesn't really matter. So, so even if that's the case, is, am I going to let this change how I'm going to behave today? Do, do, if we are, if it is all over, even in say, you know, who knows when, let's say it's over next year, am I going to just choose to spend my last year just sitting around talking about how fucked we are? Or oh, am wow. I going to go out and try to serve and try to be a steward of the land where I live? and try to be, you know, treat people well and love and live life and appreciate what's here Absolutely. now. And it just, it, I'm being a broken record, but it does keep coming back down to that. And that, that really is, 
what is left, you know, when all this other stuff is burnt away and gone, what is left? And then, and, and we do have this opportunity that as, as you just said, and what Andrew talked about, that it is an evolutionary period. It is evolve, adapt, or die. Um, and we might evolve and adapt and die anyway, but uh, what's upon us right now is to evolve and adapt, you know, and, and it always comes back to what that comes back to daily work is, is how am I going to comport myself today? How can I be of service asking and listening and then acting when those opportunities provide themselves? Because if I ask that question, those opportunities to serve always present themselves. And right now, for me, that means in a very hyper-local way, literally with people where, that live in proximity to me right here geographically uh, and, people, and within this small town where I live and then maintaining a few connections with people over Zoom and different par other parts of the country and the world. But you know, my world in that sense has gotten pretty small because what I found when I really take that on in a more meaningful way, that takes a lot of time and energy. So flying around trying to change the world, uh, for me, that, that world's gone, um, even after uh, assuming this you know, a vaccine comes out and uh, the pandemic it, at least is, is dampened down quite a bit. Um, I don't really see uh, my new lifestyle changing because, uh, and, and then, you know, P.S., for me, it's how I always should have been living anyway if I was going <laughs> to really walk my talk about the climate crisis. Yeah, exactly. But what you're describing is something very moving because I don't know if you know this, but in the traditional mystical systems, it said that you come into the enlightenment field when you act without agenda, giving up the fruits of action. Hmm. When you stand for decency, stand for truth, stand for compassion in the core of your life, for the sheer beauty of doing those things and not out of any fantasy that they're going to have some miraculous Star Wars effect. <laughs> so there is a way in which this horrific crisis is already, if you face it like that, an extraordinary opportunity to enter the depths of oneself and to live those depths for the sake of the beauty of those depths alone. Precisely. And that's, you know, what, what I've learned and what I've been trying to practice. And when I have the most peace and acceptance in my life is when I, I know that all I can do is take those specific actions to do those things that you just discussed, because I don't have any control of the results anyway. And P.S. I never did. You never did. Nobody I ever has. Yes. Yeah. So one fantasy that's ending with the whole world is this fantasy of the power that we have as human beings. That's a huge initiation, isn't it? To accept one's devastating limitations and from that acceptance to discover the world in which we really do have extraordinary power, the minute, local, personal world which if we infuse it with the kind of love and dignity and communion and compassion that you so represent, can suddenly become what it always really was and what the indigenous people have always known it was, an abundant field of mercy and joy in the middle of madness. That's right. That's right. And, you know, and to use another analogy, just uh, I think that helps concretize what you just said for me is I remember being in Iraq and uh, you know there's basically a, a low grade war going on the whole time I was there and yet uh, and there was madness and horrific things happening every day and tragedy and yet people kept living and people still shared meals together there were still weddings there were still funerals that people just kept living and treating each other with dignity and and got very, very adept at gallows humor. And, and that plays a critical role in helping us get through times like these. But, but people kept doing that. And that was a huge exposure for me to watch people, you know, the, the dignity of, of most of the Iraqi people uh, behaving during that time was a lesson. 
And then, you know, you mentioned indigenous people. I mean, look at what was done to indigenous people right. in this country. I mean, they were literally taken from lands where they lived and put in completely different areas that they weren't even from. So talk about adapting to climate change. Uh, you know, scholars like uh, Dr. Kyle White, uh, indigenous scholars have already you've been writing about this for a long time. Like they've already been through all of this. They've survived over 90% population reduction. They've survived plagues and disease. They've survived erasure of their culture and, and pr prohibition or, or being prohibited from even practicing their spirituality. Uh, even speaking their language. Even speaking their language, the boarding schools, what was done to their children. I mean, they have survived all of that and they're still here. So it is obviously possible. And you know, now this dominant culture has a chance to learn from people right. like that, that, that we've done a, we as the dominant culture uh, has done a fine job of doing everything it can to erase that, deny it, pretend it didn't even happen. And, and even, you know, in, in some areas, pretend like those people still don't even exist. Uh, and now that's actually the model. Um, they have modeled exactly how to be and how to get through um, absolute uh, collapse. Absolutely. Yeah. One of the things that emerged in me when you were speaking is I was born in India and my whole childhood was in India and I've gone back to India again and again because it's the place of my heart. And what India has always given me is a sense of the absolutely astounding resilience of human beings in the middle of utter boiling chaos. <laughs> the Indian poor are utterly amazing in their love, in their vitality, in their generosity, in their unbelievable directness of heart. And they continually remind me that everything that I think is essential for my life is just a fiction because they're reduced to almost nothing. But in that nothing, they manifest the everything that I'm supposed to be looking for in all of my spiritual practices and all the rest of it that I get up to. Spend one day in an Indian slum and you'll see horror that you'll never imagine possible, but you'll also experience children coming up and taking your hands. You'll experience people coming up to you and making direct eye contact with you and really loving you and really being curious about you. And you'll experience somebody making a meal for you giving you half of the day's wages so that they can have the joy of feeding a stranger. That's so mind boggling, heart boggling, but it is the reality of what a human being is. So there's something else that's happening in this crisis and it's happening I think between the three of us in this call is that there's a level of sacred friendship being born. There's a level of sacred communion being born in the middle of this despair, because we're meeting each other naked. And I experience in the middle of all of this horror, a radical deepening of all of my loves, my love for music, my love for the world, my love for my cat, my love for Carolyn, this amazing being that I've had the privilege to work with. And I experience that love for you speaking to you, seeing and feeling and knowing something of this terrible and wonderful journey that you've been on. That's worth it. That's an amazing gift to be able to see other human beings with that kind of awe and respect and tender knowledge of what they've endured and to be able to feel that level of deep union with others who are going through the same process. Exactly. And man, thank you for that. And that's, that is absolutely one of the massive gifts of this time. Just like in any crisis situation, it brings out the best and the worst in people, you know, and, right. and I've seen that in Iraq. I've seen it in uh, some of the crisis places I saw working on the end of ice. Uh, but it, it does bring out the best and the worst. And, and it is a time for each of us personally to really grow spiritually, you know, and, and I know for me personally, that times when I've gotten off track and made stupid decisions, 
the ramifications for those stupid decisions is immediate and it's harsh. Uh, conversely, when I'm on the right path and I'm open and surrendering and really walking my talk, uh, the, the chance for growth is, is it's, it's poignant and it's, it's intense and it's very rapid, you know, and, and I think that that's the evolutionary impulse right there, isn't it? Yeah. And we're seeing it played out. It's writ large across society, right? Right. Where, you know, you see what happens if you want to stay in denial and, you know, try to make America great and things like this and deny the pandemic, you see what's happening there. Uh, and then conversely, you know, or you see, I, I'm, I'm seeing amazing acts of stewardship and care for the earth uh, by indigenous people and some other groups around the country, uh, despite all odds, cut funding, all the horrors that are coming down, people just keep doing it. So and you could done. say it, that it the birth this. is happening in the death. The death is offering us a birth and they're happening simultaneously. And every human being has to choose whether they're going to dedicate their lives to this emerging fragile chaotic birth or whether they're going to follow the dictates of death which will only end in total annihilation of everything that we love Precisely. right that's what our enterprise is dedicated to is that evolutionary impulse because when you discover that this most terrible of times has this astounding secret gift of a new level of compassion and understanding and wisdom that can transform your experience of your whole life and make you a far more authentic being than you've ever dared to imagine you could be, then you really entered what I would call the dance of opposites at the heart of the divine. The divine Nicholas of Cusa said is a coincidence of opposites. And as long as you think that God is only in the light, you'll never get that God, whatever you call God, this presence is also in the horror and the chaos and the madness. And when you realize that that horror and chaos and madness can actually birth in you, something you didn't know you had a level of courage and dignity that you never imagined you had, then you can get with that. And that evolves you to a different level of presence. And whatever happens to the world to have lived that different level of presence is an astounding thing. Thank you. Does that make sense to you? Perfectly. You mm -hmm. exemplify it. That's why when I read your book, I thought, my God, this guy really knows this. He's living this. And what's so moving about your book is that you don't bring in any spiritual fla, fla, fla. Mm -hmm. You don't talk about Buddhism or Hinduism. You are, you're, your book is written on the wire of direct, decent human experience, but it shows so clearly this evolution. That's why it's such an important book for everybody, whatever their spiritual or non-spiritual way of being is. Because when I read it, I read it as a book about the discovery of this strange, miraculous diamond hidden in the boiling pus of this time. Well, thank you. I am so grateful to you, Dar, for who you are and your work in the world and your willingness to spend some time with us talking about these these incredible times that we live in these horrible times these amazing times well thank you carolyn and andrew both it's been a really extraordinary conversation and uh really it's uh yeah just like what you said andrew it's it's uh, another gift of these times is to have friends like both of you and conversations like this. I'm, I'm honored that you invited me uh, to be part of this conversation. Oh, you're one of our heroes. Are you kidding me? Absolutely. You are one of the people we look to and recommend to everybody to get with what's really happening because you've laid it out so beautifully, but you've come through it. And the person that I'm staring at is a person who is grounded and in love. Well, again, thank you. I, I'm blushing, certainly internally. But... Oh, blush away, <laughs> blush away. Blush away, my friend. <laughs> thank you for everything. Thank you. Well, thank both of you.
God bless your amazing life and work. Thank you so much.